The search for an elixir of life that would grant immortality. Untold wealth with a philosopher's stone. The alchemist did work in a dark room over a fire and boiling cauldron. Dark magic and satanic rituals. Was alchemy a sinister practice as portrayed in countless books and movies? Or was there something more to the obsession that held great minds in thrall for centuries? In its broadest terms, alchemy is the name given to the practice of changing matter from one form to another. It is defined as a forerunner to the modern science of chemistry. But alchemy has broader connotations involving such esoteric terms and pursuits as the occult, mysticism, and religion. It is associated with legendary and alluring phenomena like the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, a potion set to grant immortality to those that drank of it. Not only that, but titans of history and science like Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton were also devotees of the arcane practice. Before we learn more about the wonders of alchemy, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. The word alchemy is closely related to chemistry, and in the medieval, renaissance, and early modern periods, the two words were for the most part interchangeable. Both share their etymology with the Greek term chimia, or chimea, which has to pour as its root, and it refers to the art of alloying metals, already an established practice for millennia by the time of classical Greece. In some ways, then, medieval alchemy could be seen as the continuation of the art which had already given rise to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Broadly speaking, most alchemists, at least as far back as Aristotle, who wrote in the 4th century BC, believed that all metals were a mixture of mercury and sulfur, and changing their properties, for example from lead to gold, was simply a matter of adjusting the levels of these two elements, or reprocessing the base metal through some kind of transmutation. A common belief of the period was that gold and silver represented the noble metals while mercury, lead, tin, and iron represented the base or lower metals. If the base metals were composed of the same elements as the noble metals, it was believed, then the transmutation of base to noble metals was an occupation worth undertaking. This belief that elements like iron and lead were compounds was created in a large part from the effect on these substances when they were processed. When applying heat to purify the metals, different colors would often be obtained due to impurities or other elements being present with the untreated samples the alchemists possessed. The general view among alchemists was that a fundamental material known as the Philosopher's Stone could be used to convert the base metals into noble varieties. A precise definition of the famous Philosopher's Stone is difficult, if not impossible, as the legend derived from many different cultural, scientific, and religious strands. There is one school of thought that the Philosopher's Stone may have been the prima materia from which the four elements of antiquity were derived – earth, fire, air, and water. Prior to the Renaissance and the rediscovery of the work of Aristotle, the works of Plato were highly influential in European thought, and this explanation for the origin of earthly matter appears in his work, Timaeus. Finding the Philosopher's Stone was an art named Chrysopia. This process is generally held to have involved applying heat to different materials for sometimes long periods of time even several days, and reducing the matter down to its most elemental form. Each alchemist had his own framework and ingredients for this process, and even before the advent of thermometers and lab equipment in the late medieval and early modern periods, the heat was to be kept at a precise temperature, no easy task when working with charcoal or ordinary wood fuel. Despite its occult and fraudulent connotations, alchemy was in many ways an extension of metallurgy, and it did result in the discovery of compounds that had utilities. Alkahest, for example, was said to be a universal solvent that could melt away any substance and was useful for removing contaminants from mined metals. Alchemists were also working in an age that was far more superstitious and concerned with the supernatural than our own time. As late as the early 1600s, the King of England and Scotland, James I, wrote a book on the existence of witches, their practice of disguising themselves in society, and the threats they posed to the public good. Torture and execution by burning were famously the penalties for witchcraft and other unapproved supernatural practices. And as the extraordinary aims and appearance of alchemy could easily fall within these brackets, alchemists were also careful to keep their activities discreet when they could not be assured of their personal safety. One particularly amusing example of this is alchemists referring to cold dragon, which creeps in and out of caves. Modern decoding has led researchers to decipher that the term in question refers to saltpeter, potassium nitrate, now used in food preparation and toothpaste, and even helping in the removal of tree stumps by breaking down the composition of the wood. In the same way that modern memes and slang derive from popular culture, alchemists would layer their writings in allusions to historical, mythological, and religious terminology, thus making their work alluring and mysterious to even the lay reader. The experimentation of alchemists led to other successes also. 
The printing press of Gutenberg, which had the effect of disseminating knowledge around Europe and then the rest of the world like no other invention in history until the advent of the internet, was made possible by printing type letters that were made from an alloy of tin, lead, and antimony. Gutenberg's ink was also oil-based, another result of the alchemic spirit of experimentation. The story of the 17th century German alchemist, Hennig Brand, is one of the best examples of how alchemists could stumble upon world-changing discoveries by means which would by any reasonable measure be considered eccentric, if not downright unhinged. Brand, a native of the city of Hamburg, and whose wife's dowry supported him in his experimental pursuits, was searching for the Philosopher's Stone when he decided to leave jars of urine to sit for up to a fortnight until they developed a noxious and offensive odor, basing his theory on a formula in a centuries-old book on chemical processes by which silver could be created using concentrated urine along with alum and coal dragon, or saltpeter. He then boiled the rancid urine until it was a paste, to which he then applied heat. When the resulting substance became red hot, it would catch on fire, seemingly spontaneously, and Brand allowed the resulting flaming liquid to drip into a container, which he then covered and left to cool. Once the heat had dissipated, the now solid oil glowed with a green light. Brand had not discovered the Philosopher's Stone, but he had discovered phosphorus, a vital material for flame retardants, matches, fertilizer, and military weapons. In the true style of medieval alchemists, Brand kept his discovery to himself in a bid to profit from it, rather than publish his findings in a journal as a scientist would do today. Monetary issues forced him to sell the process to a fellow German alchemist, who then in turn sold the secret of phosphorus to the Anglo-Irish scientist Robert Boyle, who is generally regarded as the first man to practice what is now modern chemistry. Even though he was himself a believer, at least in theory, in alchemic transmutation and the possibility of the Philosopher's Stone. This was something he shared with his younger contemporary, Isaac Newton, who is similarly described as the founder of modern physics. Most famous for his theory of gravity, Newton's actual work and influence went far beyond his modern reputation. The true depth of his discoveries will likely never be known. Newton deliberately wrote his groundbreaking Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, in the by then outdated Latin rather than English, so that fewer people would be capable of reading it and he would thus be less bothered by questions. The reason for this seeming disinterest was that Newton, the most brilliant mind of his time, spent the majority of his life searching for the Philosopher's Stone and the means to transmute base metals into noble ones. He was also master of the Mint of England, so this pursuit would have carried large benefits. The 20th century economist John Maynard Keynes once purchased a case of Newton's notes, expecting to discover untold and fantastic insights into the nature of the world, but found on inspection that it was filled with the notes from years of experimentation into alchemy. Newton started the Principia after a visit from Edmund Halley, who had wished to consult with him on the inverse law of planetary motion. Halley's journey to Newton was demonstrative of a new spirit of collaboration amongst what were then termed natural philosophers, who shared in many of the beliefs of ancient and medieval alchemy, but who would in time come to be described as scientists. In a conscious break with the individualist and secretive practice of alchemy, Boyle and Halley were early members of a group that was originally called the College for the Promoting of Physico-Mathematical Experimental Learning, but would be amended to the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. The Royal Society was founded in 1660, while the equivalent French Academy of Sciences was founded in 1666. Instead of keeping their findings to themselves and recorded in code, scientists were now encouraged to present their ideas to their peers at regularly held meetings and lectures, and the findings were debated, critiqued, and supported by fellow experimenters and researchers. This collaborative, peer-reviewed process meant that the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries saw a cascade of discoveries and inventions in a proliferation unseen in human history. The new science now led the world, but to paraphrase the words of Newton, who straddled both the old and the new, the new science was standing on the shoulder of alchemy. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.